The change in the relationship between customers and companies is mirrored in the relationship between citizens and their governments. If you could actually combine that innate intelligence, millions of different diverse opinions from people who have different perspectives, you would end up with fantastic policies. Right now, the whole model of policy development and arguably of democracy is, is a broadcast model. It goes like this. I'm a politician. Listen to my advertisements and debates. Then go and vote for me. And then I'm going to broadcast to you for four years. And then uh, we get to do it all over again. You vote, I rule. This model is inappropriate for the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not talking about people lobbying government or outside parties influencing government. I'm talking about, in some ways, unbundling and reconstituting what is a government. I think there's a great potential for decision-making to start actually on a ground level, on a, on a far less grand stage than Parliament deciding about immigration laws, but actually about really participatory budgeting. I have nominated a project which is to uh, regenerate a churchyard at uh, Markham Parish Church. The whole idea is that the people of Poulton and only the people of Poulton will vote on each project and the £20,000 will be given away this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start proceedings in five minutes. Each group is going to have a three-minute presentation, um, and we are going to have to keep it very strictly to three minutes. Let's start off, then. We have David from Morgan Parish Church. We know that people's perception that they can participate in decision-making is a key driver, has a direct correlation with levels of trust and satisfaction. I therefore commend this project to you and ask for your vote this afternoon. Now, we know that both trust and satisfaction are taking a bit of a dive in, public, in the public sector at the moment, so actually uh, there does seem to be a correlation between the sense that people can influence decisions and, and trust and satisfaction. It doesn't necessarily mean that they do, but it's that sense that they can. I'd like to hand you over now to Ebony, who'd like to speak. Hi, my name is Ebony. We would like you to give us a grant for £2,000. So in order for us to continue, please, please support our mood. Hello, I'm Dean Harrison. When you do it in public and when other people know it's your reputation on the line, right? I can give my mate 10 out of 10 for his little project, but in fact, this business about making the hospital work better in the town I live in. Evacuation. Like, I've, I've actually got to pay some attention to that. Once you deliver something that actually allows people to make a decision, it's incredible how compelling it is, how willing people are to participate in these, in these things, because they are exciting. Thank you very much for this. Thanks very much. That's why people are, um, are, are less engaged in, in, in politics in the, in the representative sense, but they're much more engaged in politics in a personal sense, in terms of the, the, the power that they feel to, to affect the, their community, the world around them. I think that's, that's steadily increasing as their trust in representative politicians is steadily decreasing. Democracy is a lot more than majority rule on a nightly basis. The technology is becoming possible for millions of people to have a conversation. The assumption that people will be included is spreading so widely and so deeply. That, I think, is going to be a big driver of governmental change. It's not just when it becomes an option for the people and people in, in, in elected office, but also an expectation of their constituents. It's just that now we have, you know, a mass consumer technology that supports this. And so 
we're only now beginning to discover what we can do with it. And of course for government and politicians that is a profound challenge the way politics is normally done which is you know we communicate from on high from parliament from Whitehall and only once every four years or five years is there a general election where the public are brought in. Now I think that's a good thing that this change is happening but I think it will shake up British politics and indeed politics around the world in a way that people probably haven't uh, anticipated yet. I think representative democracy was based on the idea that people are thick. That's not true. I think there's a much more radical thing that will happen, which is basically that people go around the side of representative democracy, and rather than saying, I want to kind of have input on what this, this politician is deciding in Parliament, they'll do it themselves. I think what we'll see is just some of the activities and powers of government um, moving into the, the public realm and they will, they will be run better by citizens than they are by government. There's a whole new model that's emerging where we become part of the government. I call it Government 2.0. What I think will happen is going to be a much higher degree of hybridization between government and the people, and particularly the groups of people that they serve. There's a good analogy for the new model of government in terms of the changes in the internet itself. MySpace beats MTV. CNN.com gets eclipsed by Blogger.com. Similarly, with government, governments, rather than doing everything, could more create a platform whereby citizens and others can self-organize to create better value than what currently exists. Of course, there are lots of challenges in doing something like this. There'll be saboteurs. Um, there'll be some people who won't have access to the web. There's the whole complexity of millions of ideas and how these get aggregated together and the good ones come to the fore. But these are all in the category of implementation challenges. They're not in the category of reasons not to do it. In any revolution, there are downsides. Um, but I'm optimistic that um, you know, we're living through what economists would call a positive supply side shock to the amount of freedom in the world. More people can say more things to more people than ever in history. And that, that is still growing enormously. And um, I think in the times when we've seen enormous increases in, in intellectual or political freedom, there has certainly been a period of chaos immediately afterwards. But that over the long haul, the values of those changes have been not just mainly positive, but, but enormously positive for society. have a, a form of government that engages and understands and knows what to do with what people are saying. It's a politics where, um, where you can help as well as just say like what you want and, and that's, that's an amazing thing and, and at the moment we're starting to see that with, with some online projects but imagine if you know, a country was run like that or imagine if a, even just a, a, a town was run like that. Um, as time goes on, we will see people increasingly comfortable participating in situations where the social value is really about other people caring enough rather than someone being paid to provide that value. And where the end point of that is, I don't know. But I do think the end result is going to be quite profound. <laughs>